Hi everyone, my name is Rachel and I'm a PhD student in the Autonomous Systems Lab and in the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. And today I'd like to talk about incorporating sample efficient monitoring into learned autonomy. And the motivation behind this is that in a lot of robotic systems with learning enabled components, the cost of failure is really high. So for instance, in autonomous driving, a collision could kill people. In a healthcare setting, a wrong diagnosis could lead to the wrong treatment. And for a robot on the factory floor, these robots are working alongside people, and we don't want them to cause injuries. And these are just a few examples of critical high stakes applications. And in these types of settings, it's really important to be able to have warning systems that will issue an alert when an unsafe situation is imminent. But these systems are really complex, so guaranteeing safety is not really something you can do from first principles. So we need empirical data-driven methods. So in this talk, I'm going to present two ways of addressing this problem. In the first part of the talk, I'll introduce a real-time warning system framework for detecting unsafe situations when there's no distribution shift. Um, for example, in a driver assistance setup, the system could provide a warning when you're about to crash or something like that. But one limitation of this method is that the distribution of the unsafe samples needs to be the same between the training and test data. And so in order to deal with that, in the second part of this talk, I'll present a method for detecting distribution shifts. So for instance, if we have an autonomous vehicle deployed, and the weather changes over time, or we have sensor degradation over time, the warning system from part one might not work, and we'd, be, we'd like to be able to detect that. OK, so I'll start with the warning system framework for detecting unsafe situations. The relevant paper for this part of the talk is called Sample Efficient Safety Assurances Using Conformal Prediction, and this paper is on archive. And like I mentioned earlier in this work, we introduced a real-time warning system framework for detecting unsafe situations. And this framework is specifically designed for robotics applications. And it can provide safety guarantees even when there's not very much data available. Here's the high-level overview of how we approach the problem. And we're going to use a running example throughout of a driver alert system. So in a car, we might want to have a warning system that will alert you every time you're in danger of crashing. And this warning system could have errors, which could be false positives or false negatives. And in this scenario, false positives would mean that you got some extra warnings, and a false negative would mean that the system failed to warn you when you are about to crash. So in this particular setting, uh, the focus of this work is on providing a high probability guarantee for how many false negatives are allowed. And the way we do this is by collecting a data set of training points of unsafe examples, running it through our system, and using the framework of conformal prediction to provide guarantees limiting the false negative rate. And our system makes these guarantees in a very sample efficient way. So how do we get these guarantees? When people think about guarantees in, in robotics, we typically think about confidence intervals and accurately estimating error rates with statistical learning theory. But this method also has some drawbacks, namely sample complexity. Um, if you want confidence intervals, you need a lot of data. But we could also think about guarantees in a different way. So we could, try to sacri we could sacrifice trying to estimate the false positive and false negative rates exactly and instead consider a more task-centric notion of what if we care more about the false negatives. And this one-sided guarantee is what's important in this type of safety critical system. So if the problem has this flavor, then we can use conformal prediction, which is a statistical tool that, produ that produces prediction sets such that the true label is guaranteed to be within the set with one minus epsilon probability. OK, so now I'll go over our framework more concretely. And as a reminder, we're using a driver alert system as our running example. And here's some of the notation that I'll be using. So x represents the current observations. So here it might be the locations of these cars. z represents the true unknown future state of a system. 
So in our example here, maybe this car moves here in the next time step. Y represents the predicted future state of the system. So maybe our model predicts that this red car will actually move here. F of Z is the true safety score. And a safety score is a user-defined metric that determines safety. So if the safety score is too low, then we consider a situation unsafe. In our example here, we define it as the distance to the nearest car. So that would be this blue line here. G of Y is the surrogate safety score, which is also something that's correlated with safety. And in this example, the functions F and G are actually the same. So G is also the distance to the nearest car, but the difference is that the input to G is the predicted future state of the system Y rather than the true unknown future state of the system Z. So here, that would be this orange line here. F naught is the safety threshold. So if the safety score is below this threshold, then we consider the situation unsafe. And in our example, that means that if these, if these two cars are too close together, then we consider the situation unsafe. And what we like to do is design a warning function such that given a simulator output Y, which is in bold here, our warning system either decides to issue a warning or not. And we'd like our warning system to satisfy epsilon safety, which means that if f of z is less than f naught, so if these cars will be too close together, then we'll issue a warning with at least one minus epsilon probability. And so the goal is to design a warning system that provably achieves epsilon safety for small epsilon while achieving a low false positive rate, meaning that we don't trivially always issue an alert. And the main difficulty here is that the warning function can only depend on the simulated future Y rather than the true future Z, which is not yet observed when the warning is issued. And your simulator might not come with any performance guarantees. So here's our algorithm to achieve epsilon safety. First, we'll compute a surrogate safety score based on the simulator outputs for each unsafe example in the training data set. So we might get a bunch of predicted uh, nearest distance scores here. Then we'll compute the safety score for the new test point and compute its quantile value. So we look at the proportion of training samples with a lower safety score than the new test point. And the idea is that if I have a new unsafe example, it should look like my previous unsafe examples. So this new test score could fall anywhere. And the probability that it just happens to be one of the largest scores is very low. So that allows us to bound the probability that we have a false negative. And so if this quantile value is smaller than 1 minus epsilon, we emit an alert. And otherwise, we don't. So like I just mentioned intuitively, if this is an unsafe example, it's highly unlikely that this quantile value is higher than 1 minus epsilon. So you're highly unlikely to not emit an alert if this is an unsafe example. And the algorithm guarantee is that if the training data and the new test data point are exchangeable, meaning that the probability of observing any permutation of the data is equally likely, uh, in other words, when you have a new unsafe sample, it looks like the old unsafe samples. Uh, also note that exchangeability is actually a weaker assumption than the standard IID assumption in statistical learning theory. So if the training data and the new test data point are exchangeable, then our algorithm is epsilon plus 1 over t plus 1 safe, where t is the number of unsafe examples. OK, so I'd like to take a minute here to discuss the trade-off between the false negative rate and the false positive rate. And there are two possibilities, the infinite data regime and the finite data regime. And I'll start with the finite data regime, since that's where we operate in the real world. So in the finite data regime, to guarantee 1 over t safety, we need at least t samples. Can we do better than this? We actually show that it's impossible to do any better than this. And we prove that in general, if there are fewer than t data samples, it's impossible to guarantee better than O of 1 over t false negative rate without incurring a false positive rate of close to 1. And since our algorithm can guarantee an O of 1 over t false negative rate, while the false positive rate is low, it's asymptotically optimal.
So that's the finite data regime. But even with infinite data, we may not be able to achieve both perfect false negative rate and perfect false positive rate. Uh, for instance, in an adversarial case, imagine that the distribution of surrogate safety scores for your unsafe samples and your safe samples exactly overlaps, so that they, these distributions are identical. Then it's impossible to distinguish between the two, and you cannot get both a perfect false negative rate and a perfect false positive rate. Um, at the other extreme, if these two distributions are completely disjoint, then it would be possible to get a perfect false negative rate and a perfect false positive rate. Um, the reality is probably somewhere in between, so maybe something like this diagram shown here, where they overlap somewhat. And so in this case, uh, this dashed line is set by the false negative rate of epsilon that you desire. And then this dashed line determines the, the false positive rate, which is this blue area here. And this is the a lower bound on the false positive rate, even in the infinite data regime. And, but note that these distributions are determined by the surrogate safety score and real world data. So you can design your surrogate safety score such that these distributions are further apart. And, we'll, and as we'll see in a few slides, we were able to design safety scores such that the false negative rate and false positive rate are both good for several real world situations. Okay, so now I'll go over some experimental results. Um, in this set of experiments, we used a, we had a driver alert system where the goal is to warn the driver of potential unsafe situations. We used the new scenes and lift autonomous driving data sets, and we used Trajectron++ as our future dynamics model. We used a distance metric as our safety score, and a distance metric as predicted by Trajectron++ as our surrogate safety score. And here are some of our results. So in all of these plots, the false negative rate is in red, the false positive rate is in blue, and the epsilon bound, the desired epsilon bound, is in green. And in, so in this first plot, we plotted these error rates versus the safety score threshold, which is the distance at which we're considering a situation unsafe. In the second plot, we plotted these error rates versus the desired epsilon bound. In this third plot, we plotted the error rates versus the proportion of unsafe situations in the training data set. And in this fourth plot, we plotted the error rates versus the desired epsilon bound for the lift data set rather than the new scenes data set. And there are a couple of things to note here. The first is that the false negative rate is always within the theoretical bound. And this is done with very little data. New scenes only had 50 to 70 unsafe examples in the training data set. And lift only had about 50. The second thing to note is that the false positive rate is generally quite good. And this is true even though we used an off-the-shelf trajectory predictor trained on a small academic data set. And the third thing to note is that our method is actually robust to label shift. Um, and we can see that from plot C here. So uh, the frequency of unsafe situations can differ between the training and test data because our algorithm depends only on the unsafe examples. And we also have similar results in our paper for a robotic grasping system, where the goal is to issue a warning when the robot will fail to pick and transport an object. But I'll skip going over that for now for the sake of time. And you can refer to our paper for more details. So to summarize the first part of the talk, we introduced a broadly applicable framework that uses conformal prediction to provide safety assurances for warning systems. We demonstrated empirically that the false negative rate guarantees hold for a driver alert system and a robotic grasping system. And we empirically observed a low false positive rate. OK, so that method works pretty nicely if the data distribution didn't change. And in that case, our system will usually do well. And we can even give safety guarantees like I just discussed. But what if there is a distribution shift? In these scenarios, not only do we, get worse, do we not get these guarantees, our system might also perform worse. So for example, here's an autonomous airplane taxiing system that fails and causes the aircraft to go off the runway when daytime turns to nighttime. So daytime is on the left, nighttime is on the right. And we can see on the right, 
that the airplane is veering off the runway. So we want to be able to actually identify when the distribution shifts. And that brings me to the second part of this talk, which is a warning system for identifying distribution shifts. The relevant paper for this part of the talk is called Online Distribution Shift Detection via Recency Prediction, and this paper is also on archive. So our goal here is to detect distribution shift in a streaming fashion. This is useful for robotics where data comes in online quickly and with guarantees limiting the number of false alarms. Because if there are too many false alarms, the warnings will be ignored by the user and therefore not useful in practice. And we're looking at gradually shifting episodic situations. For example, for an airplane that repeatedly taxis down a runway, there could be gradual distribution shift over time due to sensor degradation. And we'd like to issue an alert before a major problem occurs. So here's a high-level overview of our method. We, again, target safety-critical robots, uh, like an autonomous aircraft using a deep neural network for perception to taxi down a runway. And in this example, the deep neural network used for perception is unreliable under distribution shifts, like daytime to nighttime. So to improve safety, we design a warning system that detects distribution shifts. And we do this by training a neural network to predict which samples are more recent and issuing a warning when the neural network is consistently able to predict recency. OK, so now I'll go over our method more concretely. Our approach is to design a test statistic such that if the distribution shifts, this test statistic will grow and we'll know that the distribution has changed. So how can we get this kind of test statistic? Well, martingales give us a very good tool for doing this. OK, so what is a martingale? Well, a martingale is a sequence of random variables, m1, m2, et cetera, such that the expectation of mn plus 1 given m1 through mn is equal to mn. And they have this nice property formalized by Dube's inequality which basically says that the probability of a martingale growing very large is very small. For example, the probability that a martingale starting at 1 grows larger than 100 is less than 1%. OK, so here's what we do. First, we train a neural network model to distinguish between older and newer samples. So we input two samples, two images. One of them is more recent than the other. And we ask the neural network model to do a binary prediction problem and predict which one of these two is newer. Then we'll define an indicator variable, y, that will be 1 if the model predicts correctly and 0 otherwise. And if no distribution shift has occurred, then y is a Bernoulli random variable with p equals 0.5. So we can define a martingale as shown here. And the martingale. If there's been no distribution shift, the martingale should not grow. The intuition here is that if your distribution didn't shift, your classifier should not be able to guess whether a new sample is actually new, better than random chance. Um, and therefore, the probability that it makes a correct guess is 1 half. And because the probability is 1 half, then we have a random walk. And one thing we know about random walks is that they're unlikely to deviate significantly from their mean by standard concentration results. And so more generally, we use a martingale, which is an extension of a random walk, to make a test. And we know that the probability that the martingale grows large is very small. And that's how we can limit our false positive rate. OK, so now let's look at some experimental results from this method. So to validate the performance of our method, we used image data from an autonomous aircraft in a photorealistic flight simulator that repeatedly taxis down a runway. And here we have a gradual daytime to nighttime shift. So this is the simulation of the plane taxiing down the runway in the morning on the left, evening on the right. This is the same one that I showed earlier. But just as a reminder, the, this shift causes the airplane to veer off the runway. But with our method, we can actually detect this shift within 13 episodes. So our method is in blue. And note that after 13 episodes, the sky isn't even dark yet. 
And meanwhile, prior methods take much, much longer to detect this shift. So then we looked at a distribution shift caused by a small change in the camera angle. And this could happen, for instance, if a camera is knocked slightly askew. So on the left, we have the calibrated camera. And on the right, we have the perturbed camera. Um, it's only perturbed very slightly, as we can see here. So first, we change the camera angle very slightly, just that much. And this small change in camera angle actually causes the plane to go off the runway. In the upper right corner is what would happen without this change, but we can see that with this change, this plane is going off the runway. But our method also detects this distribution shift. And we can see from this plot that when there is a distribution shift, the martingale grows very rapidly. And when there is no distribution shift, the martingale does not grow. And we also find empirically that we have a very low false negative rate. Um, in our experiments, each time there was a distribution shift, our method did actually catch it. OK, so to summarize this part of the talk, we designed a warning system that detects distribution shifts on high dimensional data rapidly and in an online manner. And through extensive experiments, we validate that our approach significantly outperforms prior work. So to wrap up the contributions from this talk, we present two methods that work together to help us safely deploy robots in the real world. The first method is a warning system that issues alerts when a robot encounters an unsafe situation. Um, but its limitation is that it assumes no distribution shift between the unsafe samples in the training set and in the test set. And so to address this limitation, in the second method, we presented a method for quickly detecting distribution shifts from data encountered in the real world. And taken together, these methods could lead to a more robust robotic safety system. OK, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for the, the nice talk. Um, in the distribution shift detector, when you were showing the example of your method being able to detect uh, the distribution shift before it even like visually looked like the sky was getting dark, does that mean that your method would give like a warning of distribution shift very early and maybe before it's actually necessary to uh, enact any change, like reasonable change before it can that distribution shift? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and yes, that would be the hope. So uh, like, so for situations like this, where there's like a gradual change over time, like, like maybe you have gradual sensor degradation or something like this, the hope is that if you catch this early on, then that's before like a massive failure happens and you can uh, you can do something about this to fix the situation before a big problem occurs. Yeah. Maybe I didn't fully understand, but the neural network model that you train, like, could you talk about how you would train it for um, like the daytime to nighttime example? Like, is it just method handle like distribution shifts that occur due to um, like changing time of day, or would it also have been able to handle the change in camera? Oh, yeah, it can, it can handle, it should be able to handle any type of distribution shift. So the way I trained it, uh, first of all, this was like a super simple neural network model. It was like a four-layer four neural network. I didn't do anything fancy at all to it. And I'm sure you could do better if you tried harder on the architecture side. But um, uh, all I did was I, uh, I basically divided the, the training data, which is pre-distribution shift, uh, into like a first half and a second half. And uh, I took one point from the first half, one point from the second half. These are pairs. And I want to train the neural network to be able to distinguish which one is newer. So when there's no distribution shift, like the neural network like, doesn't particularly learn anything. Uh, the accuracy is like one half. But as, uh, like at test time, um, I keep adding new points to the second half data. So when there's a distribution shift, if the second, ha if the second half data looks different than the early data, then the neural network should be able to learn that they look different and be able to get high accuracy 
So will this work if, say, there's a sudden change? So uh, you trained it from morning to afternoon. Maybe suddenly there's a, a thick cloud and it becomes very dark. Will it be able to detect that? Yeah, so actually in our camera angle example, we, it was a sudden change. So the method does work for sudden changes. There's nothing in the method that prevents it from working on a sudden change. The reason we're trying to focus on more gradual changes, which I think happen fairly often in robotics, is that if this very sudden change does cause a catastrophic failure immediately, even though our method catches it within like 10 episodes, maybe that's already too late if a sudden change truly causes a catastrophic failure. So yeah, our, our, our focus, the, the focus of this is sort of more towards like gradual changes. I guess a follow up to that would be if you can capture that there is a gradual change, can you also capture through this method what this shift is? Uh, or would that require some more work? That would, that would require more work. Yeah.